Ladies and gentlemen, Dames and ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur Dam. Уважаеми господин председател, Chair, ladies and gentlemen, members of parliament, representatives of the media, let me open today's conference. First of all, I'd like to make an introduction to the process of the conference itself in the European Union. It is clear that Europe needs a change, and we've been discussing a change for a long time, but like any other change, there is the question how, what reforms need to be done on the European level? What should be done so that the European Union becomes more effective and efficient internally and also meet the expectations of its own citizens in the global affairs? The conference cannot be just an exercise in listening or in democracy that aims to listen to the voices of the citizens. Well, it is undoubtedly successful. Let me start with a key sentence from the very beginning. Many people wanted this conference to fail, but it did not fail. It succeeded because it gathered all the positive voices for Europe of those people who like Europe. And also it listened, it heard the negative voices that for some reason do not like Europe and their legitimate voices. Let me remind you about Brexit. Why did it happen? Well, because uh, the British, they said, well, we can't go on like that. The European Union does not work for, for its citizens. I'm, I'm not saying that all the reasons were true, but I'm saying that at any point of time, we need to be ready to listen to the criticism. But Brexit provided an opportunity for the European Union to become united, to be stronger, to believe in its own power to overcome the crisis. Today, we met with startup associations. And at the meeting, one of the speakers said, well, isn't it logical when you look at the European Union and see how after each crisis, the European Union makes a step forward, uh, the financial crisis actually consolidated the European Union and then it went on its way for 10 years. Many people expected Europe to fail in terms of the delivery of vaccines and the economic uh, implications of the pandemic. But Europe met the expectations. It did not fail. It united. It braced and met the expectations of the citizens. And now there's another crisis because of the Russian aggression in, the, in Ukraine. And for the first time, the European Union allocated 1.5 billion euro for targeted assistance for Ukraine in the form of weapon deliveries, weapons deliveries and arms deliveries. And when Europe wants to build its own political and moral credibility, this is the way to go. And I agree with people who say that uh, in order to become a geopolitical geopolit project, e European Union should become, first of all, a political union. Yes, I agree. We cannot use institutions that belong to the 19th and 20th century. We need to reform institutionally. And I do not agree with people who say that the treaties are not uh, an alternative. Well, we 
there are a lot of things that uh, we can do without changing the treaties, without amending the treaties, but there are many other things that we can do by amending the treaties. Uh, both the Bulgarian government signed a document that uh, said that uh, it uh, is not for it is not for more integration. But the uh, knowing the historical past of the European Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, Berlin Wall, and uh, the uh, fight for all democratic standards and for unity of all 27 member states, and at the same time looking at uh, enlargement at the Western Balkans. This is the way to go because uh, enlargement is the best way to break away from the totalitarian past. And uh, Bulgaria had a clear pro-Atlantic position. Um, and uh, back then, uh, Tony Blair, the prime minister of the UK, said Bulgaria and Romania will be rewarded for belonging to a certain value system. and they chose the way of civilization, and now we are part of this civilization. We made a strategic choice to be part of NATO and the European Union. We cannot look indifferently to the countries from the Western Balkans. And um, recently, uh, this uh, idea has been circulating very much. Uh, let's uh, separate Albania from North Macedonia, and let's uh, give a prospect for Albania, for, but not for North Macedonia. Uh, but the European acquis was uh, fulfilled by, uh, has been fulfilled by both countries. Uh, so how can we uh, explain to the next generations if we are insisting on this argument that we have a historical past, that we want to have a future together with uh, North Macedonia and the European Union. How can we separate then one country from the another? What moral weight uh, will Bulgaria have uh, on the international stage and in the face of its own citizens, especially those who want to be part of the European Union? That is why with this um, introduction, I wanted to outline the issues facing the uh, European Union. Uh, to me, the solution is uh, stronger integration within the Union, together with uh, the enlargement of the European Union. And uh, we have to do uh, everything our best uh, uh, to uh, to work towards this goal. If we fail and if we uh, do, do not meet the expectations of Ukrainian citizens, uh, Europe will collapse, it will fail, and uh, it will not be able to find its image uh, in the next decades, I would say. So this conference is uh, much larger than my initial uh, statement. It will try to show different perspectives, but uh, I will not uh, tell all the details now. I'd like to give the floor now for a welcome uh, address before we uh, start uh, with the uh, work with the real work i'd like to give the floor to the uh, president of the movement for rights and freedom uh, mr mustafa karadeo good evening first of all i'd like to welcome our guests and especially the chair of the uh, liberal group, uh, the European uh, uh, Parliament, Mr. Stéphane Sejourné. I'd like to thank you for your attention, Your Excellencies, all ambassadors, all the representatives of the uh, diplomatic corps. I'd like to thank uh, the members of parliament. I can see mayors in the audience. There are also representatives of the youth organization of the uh, movements for rights and freedom. Dear participants, uh, dear guests, the conference uh, on the future of the European Union has come to an end. We heard the report on the Day of Europe, the 9th of May. We heard that the European Union, and that's an only natural, that the European Union 
is trying to meet the expectations of its own citizens for democracy, peace, freedom, and uh, both, both personal and economic freedom, rule of law. The European Union needs to continue to develop and live up to those expectations. We, as citizens of the European Union, we must not be afraid of opening up the power of United Europe. We read in the reports that the conference agreed on nine topics with 90 uh, with 49 proposals and over 320 measures however uh, the institutions both the uh, european parliament the european commission the council of the european union and uh, the european citizens with their participation in the conference have been discussing the ways to for the european union to develop because we can see that uh, some of the proposals can be implemented without any amendments to the treaty uh, for the European Union, but for other things, we need a change. And the institutions of the European Union need to be leading after this one-year conference, and we all together should set the direction to go. We, however, can see that the European Union in some of the topics needs more consolidation, even topics that have been discussed for a long time, like energy and transport connectivity, which in one way or, or another, we can, we think that we could develop with to, today's situation in the European Union. However, now in a situation in, of war in Europe, we can see that uh, security is not enough, energy security included. We also need uh, some form of independence or at least a prospect for independence. We need our own vision plan, the European plan for security and independence. From that perspective, we can see that it's not enough to try and develop those topics in today's situation only, but there are also other topics cropping up that give us indications that we should be thinking about. For example, the Bulgarian Prime Minister signed a document and committed Bulgaria without any discussion having uh, taken place in the country, not among the government, the politicians or citizens, whether Bulgaria wants an adjustment or not. And this is another issue when we are talking for or against on some so important issues, when we have the national stance expressed uh, that a discussion need to take place in the country. And also, when we talk about the enlargement, enlargement of the European Union, we all know the history of uh, the movement for rights and freedoms and our own stance. We know two models for resolving ethnic conflicts, the Bulgarian model and the Yugoslavian model, the Bulgarian model, the Bulgarian ethnic model, whose author is uh, our honorary president, Dr. Ahmed Dugan, is based on employment. And in the 90s, when all the world expected that the, in Bulgaria there would be a, a 
ethnic conflict, but we said no to revanchism. We said that we will build liberal democracy in Bulgaria. We would work on the way uh, uh, to democracy and equity, and we've been trying to upheld this since the 90s and in former Yugoslavia, however, ethnic issues were resolved in another way. Former Yugoslavia disintegrated. I don't want to offend anyone, but each town and city, well, became its own, uh, it became, became a, a country while we managed to preserve the integrity of Bulgaria and develop Bulgaria. What did we say at the beginning, back in the 90s? We said, well, if the Balkans were a mosaic of ethnic groups and everyone lives with their own features, then the best way forward is to be members of common unions. And for us, those unions are NATO and the European Union. And in this way, we could see the development of Bulgaria. But unfortunately, not all Balkan countries are members of NATO of the European Union now. And now there is a war, a war that could uh, transpire another issue, and this is the geopolitical influence, and I mean the war in Ukraine. And if we look at geopolitical influence through the perspective of the war in Europe and look into the Balkans, then we can ask ourselves, could Europe afford to delay the Balkans and leave the Balkans outside the European Union and NATO. And thus, the Balkans in Europe will have another geopolitical option, speaking generally. So now in Europe, we, can, we hear different voices about the enlargement with the Balkans, but those different voices need to be channeled into the security of Europe and think from this perspective about the enlargement of the Balkans and about Ukraine. Ukraine by itself, it set an important model which was the result of the Conference for the Future of Europe for or against uh, an amendment to the treaty, because at some point Europe had to have a common decision. The European Union to support Ukraine in general uh, as a whole, and on the other hand, different member states participated in this process apart from the common efforts. And uh, this is a topic that actually sets a model and a direction for the development of the European Union. Well, I didn't plan to speak too much, but uh, I want to mention one other a topic I could see the neighbors from uh, Macedonia and we as representatives of the uh, movements for rights and for rights and freedoms we wanted we tried to help in a very difficult situation that was the covid crisis and we could see in this crisis that the european union Despite the ideas of different members, the European Union had to make decisions for the, all of the European Union, and those were the right decisions. We could see they had a positive result for Europe. So from that perspective, the uh, 
evaluation of the conference will be positive. And there's no other way. From our perspective, the conference, although it was planned for a longer period, but uh, COVID had to, we had to shorten it because of COVID, but the conference yielded results. And from now on, it's time to act. And the European institutions have to act because the idea about the conference was shared by the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, and the topic was con consultations with citizens. So that was the idea, and that's what we did. Uh, there were many people who shared their views, opinions uh, in our conference, and those were very different people geographically, ethnically, of different genders, social and economic background, education. But most of all, what is impressing is the active participation of young people in the conference because they want to set their own future for their own Europe. And for us, as a movement for rights and freedoms, this topic is not something distant. It's part of our priorities, the involvement of free, active citizens in the formation of political solutions and decisions and the control over their implementation. We've been developing this uh, not on, a, on the global or European level, but on our level. In, we have experience in this already because we have a decision from 2015 together with the local authorities wherever we participate in the local authorities we consult the local populations and communities on the uh, municipal budgets for the term of office for the year for the respective year. So we have experience in this process, and it's uh, not something very new because even back in 2011, we know about the direct uh, link between uh, uh, open governance and the citizens and the authorities. So the conference has done its job and now it's time to act and now I'd like to wish success to the conference but I want also to uh, reiterate our contribution. Uh, we are defining one goal for Bulgaria and we believe that that will be the main goal of the European Union and that is energy and food supply security and independence. Thank you very much. I'd like to wish good luck to the conference. Bravo. <laughs> Monsieur Sejourné. Welcome, welcome to um, our meeting. And uh, um, and the welcome to this meeting organized by Johan Kichuk, the culture of uh, uh, Audi. This is an unprecedented effort, uh, the effort to listen to the voice of European uh, citizens. European citizens uh, and uh, politicians have discussed uh, nine different topics. Topics uh, such as uh, climate change, uh, health care, culture, uh, sports and youth. 
the final report that was presented on the day of Europe, uh, the 9th of May, 49 proposals. Uh, uh, we saw 49 pr proposals as well as uh, 320 measures. These um, proposals and measures, they might um, help us face uh, and give an answer uh, to the current uh, crisis. But the question is, uh, do they lead to a greater integration within the European Union? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your question. I'm really happy to be here in Sofia. It is very important uh, to have this um, a conversation related to the future of Europe because uh, uh, we are basically starting uh, our work right now. Our political family, um, that is uh, Audi, as well as um, uh, Renew Europe, um, believe that it is very important to um, discuss uh, these issues. Uh, these issues uh, need to be uh, translated into um, real actions. The philosophy actually has two goals. First of all, these um, proposals, they um, help us uh, solve certain uh, paradoxes. Uh, all countries, all member states, all institutions, uh, the European Commission, the European Parliament, European citizens uh, face uh, such paradoxes. Um, European citizens would like to keep their identity. The European Parliament would like to have the right to an initiative, but at the same time uh, wouldn't like to replace the Commission. The European Commission, in turn, uh, believes that it is important to make its um, work more democratic uh, on the grassroots level. The Council of the European Union um, wants to have greater Europe, but at the same time doesn't want to give up uh, decision-making by consensus. Um, the very goal of this uh, conference um, to have panels with uh, citizens uh, uh, who will take part in this uh, discussion. All of these, uh, actually, uh, all of these actions, they were part of the paradoxes that I uh, have mentioned. These proposals uh, have been discussed uh, uh, at length and they um, were uh, voted for because the institutions uh, had to provide feedback to both the politicians and uh, the citizens. Finally, uh, all these proposals, they aim at greater integration because they actually include these um, paradoxes. Um, I really feel um, um, great support for these uh, proposals. They're part of our DNA, of our political family. The European space is a political space. Um, this is uh, what uh, we have heard uh, from the speakers uh, uh, before me. This is uh, not just a diplomatic space uh, uh, within which um, um, Paris talks to Sofia and Madrid to Berlin. We have also uh, institutions and uh, we develop our political space uh, via these proposals. So we have all these uh, 49 proposals. This is what um, I can say to your first uh, question. The conference uh, um, on the future of Europe uh, ended um, during uh, the French presidency of the European Union. Emmanuel Macron was um, re-elected on the 24th of April as um, the president of France. And um, uh, the French president actually um, upheld the idea of a reform of the European Union. So do uh, the proposals of uh, European citizens um, um, 
match the stress, the emphasis uh, by Emmanuel Macron on the reform of the European Union? Can we expect to have a dynamic approach uh, uh, when it comes to the reforms in Europe? Now, with regard to the dynamic uh, um, approach, we need to have democracy and we need to have uh, politics. We need to have discussions. This is how we uh, advance in Europe. We do not do it uh, uh, by coercion. We do it by consensus. This is part of our European DNA. And this is how we have developed um, the policies of the European Union. Let me ask the following uh, um, rhetorical question. During the COVID-19 crisis and uh, um, during the Ukraine uh, crisis, um, we adapted our measures. So we managed we managed to buy the necessary amounts of uh, the necessary vaccine doses. We showed solidarity and unity within the European Union. You're well aware of all these um, developments. We have also achieved uh, um, an agreement, a historical agreement, with regard to uh, the refugees. And owing to this um, agreement that was signed by the 28 member states, uh, citizens from third countries uh, can enter the territory of the European Union. We have uh, seen that uh, um, the Council of uh, the European Union also uh, follows uh, uh, the lines of international agreements. The European Union um, has developed its work. The European Parliament has contributed a lot. A lot of agreements have been achieved, um, and what we would like to be is to stay ahead of crisis. We, uh, we take part in decision making um, in the European Parliament, and uh, our goal today, today is uh, the following. Um, um, we have these competencies as representatives of um, the peoples in Europe. Of course, one of our goals uh, is democracy. We would like to be ahead of crisis. We know that uh, uh, what we might um, face in the future are um, wildfires and um, natural disasters. We might uh, um, again, have um, to face another health crisis. So we have to make decisions uh, by referring and asking the opinion of European citizens. Now, when it comes to the dynamic um, approach, as I said today at um, the National Assembly, this is a living uh, organism, and if it is not a living organism, it will be um, under attack from populists and demagogues. Our institutions have to listen to the voice of uh, our citizens, and if um, We might even have to um, revise uh, the treaties. The goal is not to simply change the treaties of the European Union. Uh, but even if we have to do it, it should not be something that is uh, out of question. This is um, the line of uh, politics that we follow. But we have to keep persuading people. We have to use this method. Uh, and if we are smart, we perhaps uh, should uh, discuss uh, uh, public policies goals and how to achieve these goals. 
So if we pursue uh, these goals, this dynamic approach will be um, will go hand in hand. All of you definitely have an opinion about this issue. That is why um, some decisions have been vetoed, but we should not we shouldn't bury our hat in the sand. All legislative uh, texts uh, that are um, adopted, uh, that are passed with simple majority, uh, will have uh, found uh, uh, a way to avoid any vetoes on such uh, legislative texts. Um, you know, one famous case that was the case of Hungary. But first of all, we have to discuss public policies and then reforms. In the context of um, the aggressive campaign of Russia against Ukraine, the uh, Council adopted the fifth uh, package of uh, sanctions against Russia. On the one hand, the war in Ukraine um, made some shortcomings of the European Union um, stand out, but at the same time, these sanctions also harm European citizens. Um, um, are all these issues priorities uh, for uh, the European Union? Yes, of course. Uh, let me go back to what I said uh, uh, in the second place. If um, we had uh, considered and planned uh, all these sanctions, if they were uh, part of um, uh, the text of the legislative acts, perhaps we would have uh, considered also, also the aspect of solidarity. We know that uh, Bulgaria uh, is uh, much more affected than France. They, the impact is not the same. We know that some countries actually um, um, suffer more than others because um, they are strategically dependent, uh, for instance, in the field of uh, energy. Um, your political party has uh, um, its priorities. And in general, we have to show solidarity. Some countries have to be supported uh, to a greater extent than others. Perhaps we have to change the philosophy behind the support. Yes, a lot of sanctions have been imposed, but um, um, part of the sanctions are paid by uh, the European Union citizens, and this is not something new. Households have been uh, hard hit. Uh, um, the prices, the costs are rising. This is also valid for both Russia and China. Our economies have been affected, but um, in a different extent. So we also rely on solidarity, European solidarity. And this is what we have to do. We have to keep working on these uh, issues so that uh, um, solidarity is part of the European legislation. Perhaps we can consider uh, the setting up of uh, a solidarity fund. We might also consider some diplomatic measures. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Sejourne, uh, for the answers to my questions. <laughs> Provided for Macedonian, and I don't want to make the, the make it difficult for for the translators. Even though we would perfectly understand each other, um, I would like to welcome you for this uh, last part of the of the conversations today, when we are going to have a dialogue with uh, a couple of uh, friends from the liberal family who were actively involved in the conference on the future of Europe um, to discuss what are the next steps. We heard it from the leadership perspective. We heard the leader of the European liberals. We heard the leader of the Bulgarian liberals. We heard the 
uh, next steps that were announced by the leader of the, of the Liberal Group in the European Parliament. Now let's go back a little bit to the, uh, what the conference was all about. The people. Those who actually were the source of the recommendations that were mentioned before. 49 recommendations and over 300 measures to be taken place. So thanks a lot for, for, the, for the services that are helping us to, to get the chair. I think we need more. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, with me on the stage uh, the next speakers. And that is um, Annelou van Egmond uh, from the Netherlands, who is vice president on the bureau of the Alde Party. And when Annelou will be in the, in the room, she will join us. I would also like to welcome with us Silvia Dinica, senator from uh, Romania, from the, from the Romanian Liberals. Silvia, please. Yes. Have a seat. With us is also from Austria, Ines uh, Holzegerer. I hope I pronounced your name rather well. So please join us at the stage. Ines is a member of the Bureau of the Young European Liberals, LIMEC. <laughs> Elected Vice President only a few, few days ago. Congratulations, <laughs> indeed. Yes, please. And not to be left as the only guy on the stage, I would like to invite Hussein Khan who is actually Chief of Staff in the, in the European Parliament, a member of, uh, to, to the MEP, and who comes from the United Kingdom. Hussein, please. Yes. Before we continue, I would just like to shortly say what are the house rules. House rule number one. It's going to be only in English, but you can enjoy the translation in French and in, and in Bulgarian. House rule number two. If you're in the room, and you have a question, please raise the hand, present yourself, and be very brief. House rule number three, if you are online, please pose your questions in the comments. We will have somebody who is going to follow and we will give you the opportunity. House rule number four, we have to keep it on time. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I agreed with everybody who is on the panel today. Thank you. We are going to discuss in an open way, just like the conference on the future of Europe was. Citizens among themselves talking about our future, the future of our Europe, of our continent. So uh, we will address each other by the first name. Like good friends, like good European citizens, equal among each other. Equal, yes, but politically important. Annelou, I will start with you. You have been involved in politics for some time now. Uh, you've been in the... 20 years? Some time. Let's call it some time. Uh, and you've been in the Bureau of ALDE for uh, two mandates now. Yes, two mandates. But you have also been uh, very much engaged in bringing your party to great successes in the Netherlands. So you've seen how it is to work with the people, to work with the politicians, to be politician yourself. What does this conference on the future of Europe bring as a new energy, new dynamism to this European construct? Um, well, I think the process that you can have such an insightful discussion with so many people in so many different places and then bring it all together and still come up with conclusions, one would expect chaos. I mean, if you look at it from the outside, you think, what the hell have we started here? You're opening a can of worms. And then you see that actually, if it's moderated well and if you take the time to listen to people, you do get all these inputs. And then if you look at it from a little distance, actually, there's a method to the madness. There's, that it all makes sense. Mm. So you shouldn't be too afraid, actually, to go out and just ask the people what they want and not ask them if they want to vote for you once every four years, but just, you know, find a way to engage with them much more often and much more open, open questions. So you think it was an exercise worth making it, right? As it was previously said. Yes, and also I'm, I'm actually rather proud of, uh, of our ALDE because mm. we have organized all kinds of events um, and uh, we've made it possible for uh, our member parties, sometimes with the help from, from our staff in Brussels and sometimes on their own, to, uh, to have their members uh, participate and therefore the liberal fingerprint on this 
end result is something that I'm very proud of. I think you can see that we participated. We, we definitely came to the table. Yeah, I mean, there was, it's true. It was mentioned before. Sarajevo, Madrid, uh, Praha, Warsaw, The Hague, everywhere, the, the people or the citizens were listened to. Yes, yes. Good. And speaking about the citizens and speaking about politics, conference on the future of Europe, it was all about integrating those who were not listened to. And uh, actually, Sylvia, you're perhaps a perfect uh, embodiment of that. Because you're a senator now. Sounds grand, right? Because you're a politician with great responsibility already quite some time now in the Romanian parliament. But you started from citizens' movement. You were one of those who were actually the voice that we wanted to hear. Indeed, you're, you're totally right. So I guess this voice started to raise in some of the European countries a, a bit before, and when mm -hmm. I say this, I uh, I refer to my story. So at the end of 2015, I was I was a citizen, right? And we, a bunch of citizens decided that they want to have a voice in politics because they realize that uh, the political decisions affects everyday life. So politics is part of everyday life more than sometimes we want to hear or we want to talk about. So this happened in Bucharest at the end of 2015 and then we entered, the uh, Save Romania Union entered the parliament at the, uh, in local council in 2016 in the summer, but then in December we were in the parliament with 9%. Uh, so I was a senator uh, uh, in December 2016 and uh, I'm at the second and mandate right now. So, so you are right. We, we citizens wanted to have a voice and found a way by starting grassroots parties. And do you still listen to the citizens now that you are inside the institutions? <laughs> yes, yes, we still we still listen to the citizens. Of course, the uh, pandemic didn't let mm -hmm. us to be close to the citizens, but we are uh, more comfortable being there, uh, talking with citizens, than uh, being in our offices. This is what we were discussing earlier. You were telling me you are always on the street, talking to the people asking for their opinion. Uh, I, I still feel more like a citizen than a politician, I must admit it, and I don't want to lose that. And was this conference helping this entire construct of citizen-friendly political deliberation? I, I think it did, and I think uh, now it's our uh, job to talk about it more because, as you said, it, the, the dialogue took place in the same time at a more European level. So I think our job right now is to uh, look at the main conclusions, uh, which are, of course, we need a renew Europe uh, that's closer to its citizens, and also uh, the conclusion that we need more participatory mm -hmm. democracy within the function of the European Union, and take that further and, and, and go explain to, 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 to the people what are the main conclusions, and of course, how we want to, uh, to do that, how we want to, to get there. We'll talk about it, how to put it in practice. Uh, Ines, if I can turn to you. Conference on the future of Europe, right? And you are from the young liberals. You were, as you said, now elected uh, vice president of, of the young European liberals. It is about the future we would like to share together on this continent. Uh, how was this entire conference perceived by the young people? Well, um, our former LIMEC president, Antonetta, really put a focus on this conference as right now there are so many challenges, let's be frank, so many challenges to youth um, that I don't think uh, were there five, ten years ago if you look at the, the precaution of the pandemic and uh, the, the strains this had on mental health and job mm -hmm. opportunities for youth. So this is really something that uh, we were very vocal on. We gathered uh, our member organizations. We put forward uh, proposals on the one hand on the institutional side, on the other hand on political issues, like I said, on, on the uh, job market, on mental health, on, on all of this. And um, 
I really think that um, this is something we as youth will need to be persistent for the results afterwards to be then actually implemented because you can talk a lot about uh, what would be nice but it's really about uh, then implementing it and uh, that uh, is then a sign that uh, the youth and the future really matters I would say. And uh, you, you're very right. I mean, we live in a world where the word crisis kind of dominates. It's the two words dominate, future and crisis. Did the conference actually offer a ray of hope that if we are a tunnel, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel? Yes. So I have to confess that first I was, uh, I was a bit um, cautious, I would say, because there's a lot of big words and a lot of big promises mm -hmm. what the future can, uh, uh, what the conference on the future of Europe can do um, but just seeing that the majority is really interested in making this uh, this Europe this European Union work and uh, make it uh, make it better and uh, and not just splitting up and saying well we're fine um, this at least made me very hopeful and uh, we can see it also in our membership that there's a lot of hope but uh, like I said now it's about implementing everything. Well it's better it's uh, basically we are working on a project hope rather than project fear and that's what makes us the liberals different from the others so it's a conference on hope for our own future and speaking about hope I'm going to turn to, to Hussein um, you're active in politics, but you also work in the, in the Secretariat. So you bring the two sides. You are actually bringing the, the point of view of helping the politicians to bring the people, but also helping them to formulate policies. How did, from your perspective, especially given your citizenship, is from outside of what is the European Union today, you're from the United Kingdom, how does this entire concept of conference on the future of Europe look from your perspective? In what way, sorry, I am in, could you, what, what exactly are you looking at in there? Was it, was it a useful exercise? Was it something that was beneficial? Was it something that you were actively involved with? Um, so the conference, I think, was very successful. Mm -hmm. You can just see the sheer numbers of people who were involved, the cross-section of society. People traveled far. They took time off work. They you know, arranged childcare. They um, come to collaborate and uh, really put in the hours for us to really push forward. And they've come out with something amazing. They've come back and demanding institutional reforms. They've put forward solid proposals. Um, before this, we thought citizens aren't really interested in these kind of matters. And that's been proven wrong. They are interested and they want to have a direct say in the things that affect their lives. So yes, it was very successful in my opinion. So you say there was a lot of dynamism, a lot of work being put through, not only by the, by the, by the politicians, by the citizens Definitely. themselves. Yeah. So um, in a way, it was an inspiration for, for, for everybody on both sides of the aisle, I would say both political and the citizens, is that what you're saying? Definitely, and this is something that we need to continue. The conference can't be a one-off event. We need to right. make sure that we have regular uh, consultations, big tents of ideas, uh, and then as Anna said, we have to see that they're implemented so citizens can actually see what their deliberations actually go forward, they're listened to and put forward in real policy. Consultations, and that reminds me actually because Stefan was here on the stage before, this is what President Macron was doing, uh, touring the country, doing the consultations, hours and hours with his jacket off, talking to the people, answering questions and basically taking on board uh, reforms. So Perhaps this is a model that we should constantly use uh, for, 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 our, for our continent. Um, and in terms of future perspectives, I will uh, ask a couple of questions that did come from the audience before. Because before the conference, we asked the opportunity for everybody uh, who was registered to pose a question. So I have a question for Ines, uh, and I will start with the youth, because it's all about future. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the European youth have played a big, big role in focusing themselves on how the future of the continent will be. Um, have the youth been heard in this deliberative process? I think looking at the results, um, I would say 
partly. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, there's still um, a lot of uh, ways to improve, and I would say it's, it's about really showing that uh, youth matters. So there's, there's this um, proposal to evaluate if voting at 16 for the next European elections is, uh, is something that can be feasible. It's about encouraging uh, youth to be more active, to, to be more um, uh, involved in decision making. Um, I think that is, uh, that is a first step, being, being active there. I think um, politics also needs to ensure that uh, not only is, uh, is youth involved in, in consultations, but also encouraging young people to actually take uh, take on some decision making um, to, to run for elections and to right. become an active part. So I do see opportunities um, and I'm looking at the next EU elections. I'm very hopeful that uh, this will then also show in more youth participation in the elections, but also as candidates. In the last European elections already showed an increase of yes. voter participation, which was quite encouraging. And I guess this is something that should be quite motivating. And you're saying that you're partly satisfied with the outcome <laughs> from the youth perspective. You call for more participation. Would you continue being engaged in voicing your, uh, so to say, demands from, from, for, for further reform of the, of the union? Of course. I mean, this is what youth is for, to keep pushing, to keep pushing for new ideas, for um, maybe more edgy ideas, something, uh, something that youth is there to do, to just uh, be a bit bolder. And uh, yes, I can definitely say that uh, for, for the next years, this will be something we will observe and be persistent on. That's very good, because if the young people are pushing, if the young people are interested in how this entire shape-up is going to take place, Anelu, I'm going to connect it with the question that I have for you. Uh, how are we going to actually make sure that what they are pushing for, partly satisfied, is actually going to be implemented in terms of institutional reforms. It was mentioned in the previous speakers. It was mentioned also in the recommendations that, uh, that Stefan was talking about it earlier. How are these institutional reforms going to be uh, put in place in this rather complex context we have on the continent at the moment? Yeah, Stefan uh, spoke about it as well uh, mm. earlier. Um, uh, if you ask me how, how we're going to uh, implement this and is it important, I would say yes, it's important and no, it's important. Um, anyone until now, who wanted to make sure that nothing happens in Europe starts a debate about institutional reform. I mean, that's a dead-end street, <laughs> to be sure. Um, and yet, if you look at these recommendations, there's 49 of them. Uh, anyone who's ever worked as a consultant knows that if you want your advice to be followed up, you don't bring in 49 recommendations, you bring only two, two or three. <laughs> And yet there is so many valuable ideas and suggestions in there, and many of them do need eventually some reform. However, we have also seen, and, and, and Stefan mentioned that, that over the last couple of years, there were so many things that we thought were impossible and couldn't be done within the existing framework, and yet we did it. Um, so, um, yes, uh, ideally, I think Europe uh, should start working on its reform ASAP. However, this is not a reform first and then change later. I would see this as an, not as an either or situation, but just these are things that have to go simultaneously. And you know, we have to change and then we'll do the reforms along the way. But don't use the reforms as an excuse to not get started on all these interesting suggestions. You were in a campaign of your party, and you have been through the European Liberals, helping a lot of political parties in shaping their political messages. Yes. Now, with all these reform uh, ideas that are being put forward as a result of the citizens' demands, how easy is it going to be for the political parties to make their programs attractive for the voters that will include these reforms? 
well, you could copy paste. I mean, uh, there's very little in this program that I don't want to see in my own political pamphlets. Mm -hmm. um, however, you should you, you also have to focus. Um, and I think. Uh, oh, taking questions. <laughs> sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. I think uh, uh, when you look at the whole thing, I think uh, um, Emmanuel, Mac Emmanuel Macron was the one actually who looked at the whole framework and said, there's really only two, if you look at it closely, there's two things we want. Um, we want a Europe that's more independent, and we want a Europe that's more effective. And then, once it is, all these reforms that you see will be implemented. These are just on the topics, but the wider idea is more independence and more effectiveness. And uh, I think that should be the starting point of a, any political program of a liberal and democratic party anywhere in Europe. And does that include European constitution? Again, that's another can of worms. Um, and anyone would need, knows that what you do with the can is you kick it down the street. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm not against uh, any form of European constitution. However, um, in my country, uh, it was voted against, and it ended in a debate that was so non-constructive, and it was such a waste of energy um, that I'm not in a hurry to repeat that. Not because I don't believe in a constitution, but again, um, you know, we need to get this show on the road. It is not. You know, if we're not changing Europe, it's not because we don't know what we need to do, because that is in all these recommendations. We know what to do. That's no excuse. Um, and, you know, Europe is bigger than the EU. Uh, Europe is changing rapidly. The world around Europe is changing. They're not going to wait for us bickering over whatever kind of institutional reform. Right. You're very right. The, I mean, Europe is changing, Europe at large, uh, outside of the European Union. The world is changing. Uh, we are living in dynamic times, to say the least, and um, the influence of other actors are there, which brings me to the question for Sylvia. Um, the world is changing, but we have not completed the process of European integration. First, within the territory of the European Union, and then to enlarge it further. And in that context, there was a question for you about what to do with the Western Balkans. How will the conference on the future of Europe and the deliberations that were from the conference of, on the future of Europe helped to accelerate the integration of the Western Balkans and thus actually uh, put on the side as much as possible the malicious factors. I think um, it helped a lot because um, as you know um, during the conference the um, they were involved, the representative of the Western Balkans, they were involved as stakeholders in the debate and uh, they participated and there were also uh, three events, right, like in Greece, Slovenia and Italy uh, that discussed the EU enlargement and the Western Balkans and the youth were present uh, in those debates and had a voice because, uh, as you pointed out earlier, the youth are the future of Europe and uh, their voice and their dynamics should be reflected in that. So uh, if, if we are going uh, back to your question, I think the EU and the Western Balkans are on a converging path that can um, ensure uh, security, that can in ensure stability in the region and prosperity. And uh, we do share um, a common history and a common culture, and I think we share a common future too. And we've seen on 24th of February, we've seen a wake-up call for Europe, a wake-up call for solidarity, a wake-up call to defense the value of the European Union of the Europe, and uh, I think this um, enlargement is, uh, is, the, is the right way and it's the, uh, if we see also the, the signing of the accession for the three countries in between that moment and uh, now and my party in Romania supported this procedure. So we, we need to do in parallel these processes that we were discussing uh, institutional reform, making sure that the parties integrate within their platforms the, what the proposals are from the Conference on the Future of Europe, 
plus making sure that in parallel we manage yeah. to bring in the countries yeah. that from the Western Balkans that are willing to, to join, that are determined to because join. Because I think we all realize that together we are stronger, and you are talking about a, even a stronger and autonomous. We, we, have to be, we have to be economically uh, leaders, global leaders in some of the fields. We have to fight for that. We have to, to, uh, to fight to be uh, competitive and uh, to have all the pillars that make us strong, because it's as we all know, we, we started with the economic union and then we can be, and we are a lot more than that. I mean, you remind me now that when you say about unity and strength, if you, we went, we went this morning to the parliament of, of Bulgaria and what stands in front of the building, for those of us who understand and speak Bulgarian, it says, it, mean, it means the unity makes the strength. So it's actually a perfect message that the forefathers and the foremothers of the Bulgarian statehood have sent a message both to the Bulgarian politicians to understand that it's unity is something that is very important, both nationally and regionally and continentally. And um, speaking about Europe and large, which was, which was mentioned, um, as, as a consequence of the, cons of the Conference of the Future of Europe, it was first the President Macron who spoke about something new, a new political construct called the, the European Political Community. Stefan, correct me if I, if I said it wrong. And then afterwards, <laughs> it was uh, the president of the European Council, another liberal, yeah. Charles Michel, making a tour of the Western Balkans, speaking about European geopolitical community, or call it whatever, he said, uh, which would give space for the other countries who belong to the European uh, continent, and who belong to the, who share the, the same values, to be part of it. How does this idea sound from the UK perspective, given you're British? Um, well, there's the UK government perspective and the rest of us. So uh, I think the UK government perspective, when Emmanuel Macron came out with uh, the European community, you know, having this looser organization where everyone can take part and even yeah, in passing did say for the United Kingdom in there, the response was, no, merci. Um, but that's the UK government, and that's quite typical of them. So the UK side, we really need to have a competent government first. We can't have a prime minister that's inept, that lies and cheats. And it's for us opposition parties to actually get our acts together and make sure that we can have a future with Europe. Because hearing what President Macron said, that was hope for me it's as a starting proposal for where uh, we can get back because as a liberal democrat eventually we do want to be part of the union again that's a name um so yeah it's, it's, it's an excellent proposal the whole kinds of uh different levels of it i think it's something that needs to be explored and as, as british liberal or british citizen whatever a person who has uh own opinion and participated in this entire exercise on the conference on the future of Europe. How does this, uh, the, the conclusions, how does this general uh, debate help building closer links actually between the UK and the European Union? We are still traumatized from the morning news from 2016 in June when the outcome of the referendum was not the one that we have deeply hoped in our hearts that it, it will be. How does this conference actually help rebuilding those ties and strengthening those links? Well, it's the example it's setting. It's, uh, there's a few factors there where, as Liberal Democrats, we actually had conferences ourselves. Uh, Ilhan was one of the speakers. We had other MEPs come along. Um, so as Liberals, we're very much interested in what's going on. And it showed how participatory uh, dialogues can happen. They take place. Uh, they move forward. They came back with ideas such as transnational lists, which are fantastic, real European elections. So that's what we need. We need to get rid of this idea and this kind of, uh, the EU is just full of unelected bureaucrats. You know, this helps having these kind of transnational lists. And as a British citizen, it's the importance of connecting the EU with the citizens. It's really, that, that was what was missing in the UK, to build that trust. So um, that's, the proposals are a fresh breath there to move forward and how politics should be done.
So basically, when, when listening to you when you're saying as a British citizen, this brings about connection. But I believe that it would, everybody would agree uh, with you that this kind of proximity between the political processes and the citizens is something that we all need, be it British, be it Dutch, Romanian, uh, Austrian, Macedonian, whatever. Um, and speaking about that proximity, I'd like to open the floor to those who are actually present in the audience um, to join this discussion. Um, we said it's, it's an open discussion, open floor, so please, if you have any kind of question or even comment that you would like to make in, in, in line of what we are discussing here, please be encouraged to do so, like m millions of Europeans did over the, over the, over the last year. So the floor is, is yours. Just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Govorite bulgarski, ako iskate, nyamom problem. Se prevedem. You can speak Bulgarian if you want. Uh, there will be translation. Please, Ambassador. I, I would invite you to bring, to bring the microphone to the, to the front. If you just be so kind to, to present yourself for those who do not know you. I, I'm, I'm uh, Khalid Aymara, the ambassador of Egypt here in uh, Sofia and in uh, non-resident in uh, North Macedonia. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and for the invitation, you know, to uh, uh, be part of uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, debate, uh, which uh, is part of uh, thinking of the future uh, for, for the uh, European continent and the European Union members. Uh, I, I, I said the European continent because many are aspiring uh, members of the European Union uh, and um, for many years the, the Union have been a, a very attractive, I think, uh, uh, future for, for many Europeans. I'm very inspired, you know, by what was said by the, the, the Vice President of the Youth um, for Europe uh, because we, we have a similar uh, process in Egypt, uh, we, we, what we call uh, regional youth conferences that we started back in uh, 2014. And now, uh, since 2017, we have this uh, machine, which is uh, now uh, the, the International Youth Conference uh, that uh, come together every year in uh, Sharm Sheikh, uh, brings about 6,000 young people from about 130, 140 countries around the world, many of them come sometimes from, from the European Union countries. And I was wondering, you know, if, if this process that is taking place now in Europe, you know, with this uh, public debate, uh, engaging, you know, different strata of society, is um, taking advantage of other experiences, other experiences that are happening outside of the continent. Because my uh, sense is that in many of the, 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 the debates in Europe is, is very much uh, Eurocentric, and, and uh, uh, they, they are not uh, looking at, at other experiences happening around the world, uh, which is a, a big disadvantage to, to uh, the European experience. Um, uh, why? Because there are many citizens in Europe also, they, they happen to, to, uh, to come from, from other parts of the world. Uh, I mean, just uh, uh, the, the uh, North African countries, you know, they, they have a very big population in, in, inside the European Union. And, and their voice is uh, not heard enough in, in all of these debates uh, and would be quite important to, to have this voice heard. The other thing is that, uh, you know, uh, Europe uh, had been successful because it was leading by example, you know, after the, the Second World War. But uh, this momentum of leading by example have fallen behind from a perspective of somebody that is seeing that from outside, outside of Europe. And it's falling behind because uh, there is a lot of, um, uh, I would say, a discrepancy when it comes to the values that are uh, being uh, promoted and what is uh, effectively on the ground. Uh, also, the policies that are being uh, talked about and how they are implemented on the ground. Many have given the example of uh, what happened during the pandemic, but I want to give the example of what is happening now with the energy policies. Now, Europe is talking about, uh, you know, uh, common buying uh, of energy supplies. But in reality, every country is going on its own way when it comes to the energy contracts that they're making uh, right and left without any 
uh, uh, consultations uh, at, at the European level. Uh, or with maybe uh, window dressing at the European level. So that is, is a very, very uh, dangerous situation uh, to, to have a very big gap between what is promoted and what is communicated to the citizens and the reality on the ground is, is very different. And, and I would uh, think you know, that this gap is what needs to be uh, bridged uh, for any of these uh, debates uh, that would lead to uh, actual reforms would uh, give fruitful results for, for the future of the continent. Of course, the, 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 the European project also needs to look at uh, how Europe will position itself in the global world. In the global world, you know, uh, uh, it's not enough you know, to say we want to have sovereign decisions. It's very easily said you know, to have sovereign decisions, but when it comes to reality, uh, this is very far away from uh, uh, the practice. And so, uh, yes, how to position Europe is very important, because especially for, for a very important region that is very close to Europe, which is uh, the, the Mediterranean, South Mediterranean region. Uh, that's very important because uh, we, we are uh, uh, partners uh, and, and we need to, to, to understand you know, uh, how Europe is, is uh, positioning itself when it comes to uh, working with the, uh, let's say, the, the circles of interest and the, the important regions uh, in the neighborhood. This is uh, something very, very important. Thank you very much. I don't want to... to uh, Shukran Tir. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, two actually important points. One point is Europe autonomous, sovereign, um, decisive when it comes to actions. And the other point was Europe open to the world yeah. in terms of learning from experiences and in terms of dialogue with the others, particularly those who are immediate neighborhood, but also those who are like-minded in the world. How will this conference uh, reform proposals contribute to both concepts? Stronger well, Europe and open Europe? Well, I think this, this shows we need a bigger tent. Um, and uh, we, we like to think of the European Union as a community of values, and, and it is obvious that, that there's a great many people who share those values and who want to be part of that storyline and who also want to be inspired by it, but also want to bring in that inspiration um, because it is it would be just silly to imagine that that our respect for the rule of law and our respect for equality is something exclusively ours and that there's not people all over the world who feel the same and so we need to find a form a modus to to bring all these groups and, and ideas together, be it from Australia, be it from Egypt, be it from the United States, Canada, and from all over Europe, because we are on team democracy. <laughs> We've quoted Manuel Macron, my, we can also quote Joe Biden, who says uh, today it's between democracy and dictatorship. Or, uh, and obviously we are on team democracy, and that team needs to be as big as possible. Um, uh, so I would, I would welcome uh, this inspiration. I would want to be inspired and I would want you and the people you talk about to be inspired by us. Thank you. Sylvia, do you have something to contribute to this? Because it's about also about education, about the future, about how we bring experiences from, from the rest of the world and how we integrate it in our, in our own system, how, ve how valuable we take examples from, from others. I do think that the two attitudes complement each mm -hmm. other. I mean, you cannot take one out without the other. Of course, you need a, a first strong education. And in the conference, it was emphasized that we need education and we need to, uh, to transfer the quality education uh, from, from one country to the other because we don't need uh, young people with no choices that uh, move to another country because they, are, they have no, no other choice, but, but because mobility should be a liberty, not should be a, just a, uh, an exit because you have no other option. Uh, and of course, we end, we end up at education, we always end up at education, and our uh, system of education were challenged by pandemic, but I think uh, we learn a lot of that, and we can we can um, we can um, uh, take out that gap, and we can uh, be better, and we can have a stronger educational system. Of course, it's not easy. I mean, I don't think anybody at this table said that any of this would be really easy, and we can do it like 
all of it tomorrow. But I think we all agree that we can do it, and we have um, we have the proposals. And I was I was thinking earlier in the in the day that about the number of the proposals, you know, because you say 49, you know, it's like a big number, and it's. But I think in a way it's better because every time I'm also uh, thinking at national legislation, I'm thinking well. What, what do I have to do? I have to go from a general statement, a general objective, to doing something practical. How do I do it? And the more we tackle this into more details and we understand uh, better the problem, because all this is complex, uh, then we can better find the solutions. We can find the solutions fast and we can find better solutions. I think that should be our goal. Finding better solutions, that's, I, I, I like to repeat that, I'll, I'll quote you on that one. Uh, Jose Ninas, do you, need, do you want to comment something about this stronger uh, Europe and open Europe? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. um, so a couple of the proposals have come to mind about a stronger Europe. Uh, one of them, so this is the difference between the institutions. The European Parliament is pushing for institutional change. Whereas the Commission and Council, they're looking at legislative procedures and things like that and investigating how institutional questions. I think the European Parliament's got it right. The, we've got a clear mandate from the citizens for treaty change. So um, at the moment, through the, foreign, um, the Constitutional Affairs Committee, the European Parliament is pushing through resolutions. Um, we'll adopt that hopefully during the next plenary um, uh, next month. So, why? We've got things like national vetoes. We have to get rid of those. We can't let the likes of Orban uh, block the EU when we have to act quickly and decisively. We have to do something about that. Um, further, we need transparency in decision-making processes, especially at the Council. Um, another proposal is to allow the European Parliament to initiate legislation. Um, to give that legislative power, because we can't just rely on the Commission to come forward with, with aspects. So we need a real parliament with teeth. That's all of those aspects will make a stronger Europe, EU. So that we go, when we go for the elections in 2024, we tell to the people you vote for something that actually matters and delivers. Indeed. Right, Ines? Indeed. Is that is I that also so. your line of thinking? I, I hope so. Um, so in the end, we actually can vote for, for the commission uh, who sits in the commission, and we yeah. actually can make a difference there. So it's not. Um, I, I was uh, campaigning myself for the EU elections, and a lot of times you heard, well, it doesn't matter anyway. Someone. Someone will be there that I don't vote for. And uh, it's, uh, for now, it's um, still very hard to explain all the processes behind it and uh, that you don't actually vote for the commission, you vote for the parliament and uh, what this entails. Um, I think there's still a lot of potential to make uh, the EU stronger uh, by, um, by opening up and uh, decision-making processes on the one hand, but also getting closer to the citizens with, uh, with these uh, decisions that are made. Um, and uh, I think uh, the, in the discussion open or, or, or strong and mm -hmm. or strong, um, I think actually the openness of <coughs> Europe makes Europe really strong. It's, it's the diversity that we have. Uh, that some might say is, is uh, a weakness, uh, but I do think, and there we go to best practices and, and learning from each other, I do think Europe, and, and uh, especially within the EU, we've gotten much stronger by learning from each other, by using synergies, and um, that's, I, I really am hopeful that in the future this will be even more, and uh, that, uh, my children, my grandchildren will have even more possibilities than we fight for now. So, yeah. More possibilities and being more inspiration for the rest of the world, as the ambassador said, <laughs> as Europe used to serve in the past. I'll allow for one more question if there is from audience. Yes, ambassador, please. <laughs> Uh, 
Yes, I'm the ambassador of Romania to this beautiful country. Uh, I um, felt like also making a few comments because I like this conference so much. First of all, I want to say that uh, I haven't been here for too long, a little bit over a year. It is for me, to my knowledge, the first conference that is speaking about uh, the European Union. And of course, now about the future and about the conference. But I think it's really the only one. So congratulations. Overall, now I don't want to get political, but obviously Please to do. the Liberals. You can even support yeah, us. Yeah, I'm just an ambassador. <laughs> but just to say that this, obviously, the Liberals are bringing the topic to the public discussion here in Bulgaria. And I can only say bravo to that. Uh, secondly, um, of course, uh, we, the European Union and the countries in the European Union, are open. I liked very much what uh, young Vice President of the Young Liberals said. I think this is a worthy conclusion, actually, of the entire conference. Um, we should always look at ourselves through the eyes of others, and here I can only concur with my colleague, uh, the very esteemed and experienced ambassador of a very important country, Egypt. Uh, but we should always um, reply to whenever we are being criticized as European Union um, unjustifiedly. And here it's not necessarily an answer to my esteemed colleague, but just to say, energy-wise, in this crisis, everything goes through the European Commission. And yes, member states are talking uh, in a coordinated manner with the European Commission about uh, energy security in the European Union. In the health uh, crisis, these things are maybe not seen and perceived so much outside uh, the intricate way the European Union works and its institutions. It's true. Uh, and maybe we are too critical of ourselves sometimes. This openness where we uh, talk about ourselves and our deficiencies in the European Union. Uh, to the detriment of also speaking about the strengths of the European Union, while not forgetting for our partners outside the European Union, that nevertheless, the European Union is a construct that has never existed in history. And it's not just one country, it is a unity of very different countries. And what we managed to achieve together, in spite of our differences and diversity, is fantastic. And yes, for me personally, because I've worked a lot in EU member states that have been founding the European Union, it hurts me to hear that um, from the outside we are not being seen as leading by example anymore. And that is why I'm appealing also to you, the politicians here to speak more and of course to the president of um, Renew, but everybody else, and not only from your party, the ones who are doing EU politics on a daily basis in my country, I'm appealing as well, speak more about the strengths of the European Union, especially in times of crisis. Um, and last thing, really, um, congratulations for one more thing. Keep our British friends close. And bravo that you have invited representative of a party that used and still is uh, totally pro-European. Um, but you need to recover now a lot. And I uh, cross fingers that the Lib Dems do better in the UK. But all of us talking about European transnational politics, this is where we can have our British friends still anchored where they belong, belonged, will maybe once again belong to. I don't know. So thank you very much. Muito mes, Ambassador. Um, and just as a point of, of, of reflection and, and remembering the facts, uh, indeed we have a British citizen who is on our panel, and he might be member of a party that is not in majority. But if you see the opinion polls, what he says is actually the opinion of the majority of the, Brit of the British electorate. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
Given I have a British, I'll say yes. <laughs> I have a, given I have a, Brit a British nationality too, I'd, I'd concur with you. Um, and a good good reminder that Stefan, take note that maybe the the decision to have uh, by the President Macron of the meeting in the room with the mirrors was the, of the summit was not bad, because there are plenty of rooms of uh, mirrors to look at over there, and there are mirrors that show things which have to be changed and improved, but there are plenty of good mirrors that will provide reflection to us, that will encourage us that actually Europe is still an excellent example, both for our citizens, for our democracies, but also in the world that we live in. So with that note, I would like to ask my, my dear panelists to come with the last concluding remarks. What would be your encouraging remark? at the end of this, this exercise, Anilu. Well, also in reaction of what Madam Ambassador said, I think if this, has, this, this conference on the future of Europe has proved one thing, it is that you can be pro-European, you can love the idea, and yet you can see that there is so much room for improvement. Um, all these people who participated in this Conference of Europe, they didn't do that out of anger or spite or the need to destroy something, but they, they had ambitions, they were hopeful. Um, because they think, uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of things that, that are not bad, especially compared to a lot of other places in the world, but it could be so much better. And I think, um, you know, that is, that we've got a whole list, a whole to-do list now. I mean, you know, what's keeping us? 300 and something points to, <laughs> to, 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 to check. Hussein, what is your m message of encouragement at the end? So as I mentioned, this shouldn't be a one-off event. Mm. Um, we've seen that citizens want to be heard. They want to be part of the process. We have to show that we're going to actually implement what has been recommended. Uh, so that needs to be pushed forward. Um, on the re-election of President Macron, we've seen that the political center holds. The center-right dominance in Europe is dwindling. And uh, that, that gives us hope, hopefully in the UK as well. Will that happen? I hope so. So there might be change there. Thank you, Hussein. Sylvia, how does it look from the message of encouragement from a senator from Romania? Um, I, I keep in mind the word of engagement that uh, that we heard uh, earlier from the from the youth, and I think it was an excellent exercise with some very good conclusions. And uh, if we keep this engagement and we keep the engagement towards implementing all these major me measures, because I think we want a Europe that's more like them like agile and dynamic and that can adapt fast and can respond very quickly and uh, can meet our, um, our trust and our beliefs and our expectations. And I think we can do it. Trust, meet our trusts, beliefs and expectations. Can we meet that, Ines? I know that you said that you're partially satisfied <laughs> <laughs> with the outcomes, but can we meet that? I think so. I, I think um, for a positive outlook, um, we need to make sure that this conference on the future of Europe, also the European Year of Youth, is not ending there. It's not just an exercise and then we're done. And then next year it's a different year and we forget about it. Um, I, I really uh, love the points that were made, and uh, I can only say, youth, as youth, we're ready to put in even more ideas. We, we have some, we have a few, um, and uh, we're more than ready to be engaged, and I hope that um, in the future processes, youth will be um, will be part of strategic decisions, will be part of decision making, and as I said, looking into the future, also decision making ourselves. Yeah. Thank you very much. More than willing to be engaged. So I would like to invite everybody to stay in that mode. More than willing to remain engaged. And in that sense, I would like to thank the audience who has followed us online. I would like to thank all of you who came participating here. I would like particularly to, to thank our co-hosts, 
which is the ALDE party. Thank you, Ilkan, as a, as a leader of the ALDE party. Thank you, Mustafa, as a leader of uh, the bastion of liberalism in the region and in Bulgaria, MRF. Thank you to everybody who traveled. We know, Stefan, you're in the middle of the uh, election campaign in France. Go win those elections. We want uh, uh, President Macron to have a strong uh, parliamentary back backing in the Assemblée Nationale. And thank you very much to all the panelists who have joined me on this, on this lively debate. If you wonder how I got the British passport, I learned the rules. And the rules said I had to finish by 7.40, because now it's the reception time. So do enjoy yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs>